So welcome to everyone that's joined today, Society of Thoracic Surgeons. Today's the Intermax and PDMAX quarterly reporting webinar. Um, today we have uh, Ryan Cantor and Devin Cole from the Intermax Data Warehouse housed at UAV, um, the report, part of the reporting team. They'll be giving discussions today on digging deeper into your data and also um, a tutorial on the live data downloads. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Catherine Holyfield, and I'm the SDS National Database Manager for Intermax and PDMAX. So for today, the agenda, um, I'll just give some welcome and introductions. We'll kind of go over, review what we're going to be discussing today, um, and a quick update on any additions to the reports and user feedback. We highly encourage everyone to ask questions using the chat box or the question and answer fe feature. And we're very excited for today, um, our presenters today, Ron Cantor and Devin Cole. So for the team, I've already introduced myself, but we have Janella Miller, who is um, housed at the Intermax Data Warehouse and she's the quality manager. We have Jeannie Ann Love, who's the patient uh, manager and she also does um, the patient transfers. We have Ryan Cantor, who's one of our um, key speakers today. Um, Dr. Cantor is a statistician and he's the director of reporting at the Intermax Data Warehouse. We have Maceo Cliche, who's um, one of the clinical data analysts and he also works on the reporting team. We have John Pennington, who's the um, Intermax Data Warehouse, the senior data manager. So he um, handles all that good data that you enter into the database and scrubs it and packages up and sends it out to the sites and does um, also is involved in the data integrity. We have um, Devin Cole, who is another senior clinical data analyst. She's housed at the Intermax Data Warehouse um, at UAB. And Devin helps with um, the projects, the research projects, and she also is a guru at the live data downloads and the patient management tool. On the call today from STS, we have Leanne Jones, who's the STS National Database Manager for congenital, um, the Congenital Heart Surgery Database and the General Thoracic Surgery Database. And Carol Crones, our Senior Clinical Manager of the Databases. So she kind of keeps us all in line. Just some housekeeping, um, please use the Q&A function. Um, feel free to ask any of your questions, any questions that you'd like to ask. Um, we'll answer as many as we can. And we really encourage you to um, interact with this webinar and we wanna hear your feedback. So please, please don't hesitate to ask any questions. Just to give a, a quick um, reporting date, I know in the summer we made some updates to the quality assurance reports and the data quality reports. Um, we added an exhibit on the DQ reports for those missing um, implant discharge forms, and I hope that's been helpful. Um, we'll be having discussions late this fall about adding some new um, features to the quarter quality assurance report. So feel free if you have any suggestions or if there's something new or um, if you'd like something presented differently, don't hesitate to um, contact Maceo or myself. And those emails um, will be shown at the end of the presentation. So again, for today's topics, um, Ryan is going to talk about digging deeper into your data and Devin will discuss the live data downloads. Um, we're going to start today with Devin Cole. Um, she also, I don't know if you were able to view her on-demand talk for AQO. It was great. It received rave reviews about the um, form downloads. So Devin, I will let you um, take it away. All right. 
Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Devin Cole. Um, I've worked uh, with the Curso Group for eight years. So I've, you know, been a statistician on both Intermax and PDMAX. And also, just like Catherine said, I gave some talks at the at the AQO. The first one was Dig Deeper Using Your Data, where I did 15 minutes and Ryan did 15 minutes. And so I just want to briefly just remind you what that was about. So I did a live demo of the cohort comparison report and just showed how you could download the different reports, such as a single cohort at your site, how to compare two cohorts, and comparing to the equivalent of Intermax. I also did a live demo of the patient management tool, which was exploring if you want to just do a report on a single patient, so you could look at things such as quality of life and different lab values over time. A bulk of my talk at the AQO was on the live demo of the form download. That was about 30 minutes long. And so I showed you how to download all forms. I explored the structure of each form, I showed you how to do some really cool Excel tips and tricks, uh, filtering data, making pivot tables and charts. And also just maybe there's just some different research questions that you want to answer at your hospital that, you know, you find clinically interesting. So I tried to touch on some of those. And so what I wanted to do today was take a deeper look at your site's infection data using the form download and really looking at some stuff that you can do in Excel, just at the tips of your fingertips and how you can answer some really cool questions within your hospital. So Catherine, is it okay if I share my screen? Yes. Okay, cool. Sure. We'll stop mine. Okay. Okay. So I'm gonna click here and I've, you can see I've already downloaded all of these different forms. And so this is just to kind of speed up the process. I know you guys don't wanna sit, sit here and watch me download all of them. And so here I've just downloaded the major infection form. Okay, so let me, all right. So the first thing I wanna do is kind of explain what we're looking at here. Uh, so this is an Excel form of the major infection form. And what this is, is one row per infection event uh, per patient. And so let's start at the top here. And so this is saying, okay, this is the Intermax form download. This is the major infection form. Just a reminder, it's confidential. This contains all pending, incomplete, or validated forms. So it's just to remind you, it's all forms. And you can see that I downloaded this back on September 11th. So it, whenever you download it, it's going to tell you the time and when you downloaded it. And now I want to touch on what Hospital X is, because here it's going to tell you what hospital you're from. And so Hospital X is a random sample of de-identified patients. It's 100 patients from Intermax. And that's what Ryan and I are going to be doing our talks on today. And so the first thing is, what is the structure of this form? And again, we can see we have patient ID and event ID. These have been scrambled, so you, you won't be able to identify any of the patients. Uh, first name, middle name, last name, again, have been de-identified. So let's kind of scroll through this and look at the different variables that we have in this form. And then we're going to have a lot of fun and kind of do some really cool tips and tricks. Okay, so the first thing is, yes, they had an infection. And so all of these should be yes, since we're in the in infection form. Uh, the date that it happened, which all the dates have been shifted. Um, here, it's just telling you if, why was it missing, if it contributed to death, what was the, if it was in hospital or out of hospital, all the different infection locations. And then let's kind of scroll really quickly here, uh, the different uh, drug therapy interventions. And I really wanted to just show you that these are kind of for administrative reasons, but you'll see these different columns on every different form download that we have, you know, so you're going to have these four, uh, these different columns here, internal form ID, internal form status, add date, current form, hospital code, and patient report ID. And so the internal form ID is just a unique number that's given to every form that's submitted. Uh, here would be what tell you if the form is validated, pending, or complete, and you want to make sure that you're doing, well, I want to make sure I'm doing analytics on validated forms, and I'm sure you do too, but here we can see that all of these forms have been validated. Here, this is telling you when it was added. Here is the hospital code, and just to remind you again, we're using the hospital X, so the random sample of de-identified patients, and the patient report ID, which is a unique identifier given to each event that the patient um, undergoes. And so now, why don't we have some fun, guys? So the first thing that we're going to do is I'm sure everyone's really familiar with filtering in Excel, but if you're not, one of my favorite concepts is explain it like I'm five. I want someone to explain to me in a way that, you know, even a five-year-old could understand how to do this. That is a great, you know, a really great to do. And so that's what I want to help when, I, when I'm teaching you guys everything too. So if you don't understand something, tell me to slow down and I'm definitely happy to help you. And so here, what we do is we go to data. 
and we go to filter. And so now we have these little arrows that kind of drop down and let me show you how you could use this. So let's say we come here and we're like, I only wanna see the ones that happen in hospital. Well, now we filter our data and now we have this spreadsheet that only has those that occur in hospital. So you can see that how that could be useful if you're trying to you know, filter out certain things that you don't wanna see. All right, so let's do something over here with this infection, the, the date of the infection. So what we're gonna do is we're going to create a new column and we're gonna extract information from this column. So let's click here and let's right click and hit insert. And so now we have a column, a blank column here and let's title it infection year. And we're going to do a really handy function in Excel called equals year. And I'm sure you can guess what would happen if I click here, right? It's going to say 2009 because it extracted the year from this column. And so here we're just going to pull this down. So we're just copying the function all the way down to the bottom, making sure that it that you know that we hit every single one here. And now what we've done is we've extracted the year from the date. And now this is where we're going to have some really cool counts and show you some really cool stuff that you could do with this. And so the first thing is we're going to look at something called a pivot table. And a pivot table in Excel is ways that you could look at counts and percentages and all types of stuff and do some filtering. And, and, and I'm just going to show you how to do that here. So let's click here on this patient ID cell. And then we're going to go to insert. And then we're going to go to pivot table. And it's going to say, do you want all of this data? Of course we do, because we want to make something awesome here today. All right. And so now we have the, all the different columns. They're listed here. And then we have filters columns, rows, and values. And so let me kind of explain what, what each of these are with an example. Okay, so if I drag infection year, which was that column I just made into the rows, into the rows here, you can see that now all of the different rows are the infection years, 2009 all the way to 2020. And so now I'm going to drag this to values, but I don't want the sum of the infection year. I want the counts. So how do I change that? Okay, so I'm going to left click on this and click value field settings and I'm going to go to count. And voila, now what we have is a count of all the infections at our hospital per year. And so we could look at this and say, okay, we had the most in 2019. Oh, we had 14 in 2013. So this is a really great way just to get some simple counts of infections that are happening at your hospital. But this is overall infections. Why don't we, you know, drill down into something else that's of, you know, clinical interest to a lot of people, driveline infections. Okay, so now we're going to pull this to the filters column because we want to filter by if they had a driveline infection or not. And so again, here are those little drop down arrows that we saw before. So we click on this and we say, yes, I only want to see driveline infections. All right, and now we can see the count of all the different drive light infections that happened per year. We can see that we had 28. Now, I don't know if you guys are like me, but I'm a flashy person. I, I mean, tables, they're great, but I mean, charts are where it is at. So let's insert a bar chart from this. Okay, so we just went to insert and we inserted a bar chart. And now we can see that same information, but now it's in a bar chart. So let's add some data labels. So now we can see those same counts. And let's also look at, and just to show you that you can do, you know, this is just showing you through to 2010 all the way to 2020, but let's say that we don't want all of those dates and we only wanna focus on the last five years. So one, two, three, four, and five. All right, so now you can see that this is instantaneously updated to reflect the last five years of our driveline infections. But wait, there's more. <laughs> we want to add one more thing because now we have driveline infections, but what if we want to see where those driveline infections happened? Were they in hospital or were they out of hospital? Well, we can do it. So here we're going to drag this to where it says legend series. And now you can see here. So let me, here we go. And then, oh, let me put this back here. Yes, so we want this here, 
and then here. And so now what we can see is for the driveline infections, were they in hospital or out of hospital? So how do we even read this? So in 2016, we can see that we had three infections that were out of hospital that were pump related driveline. And we had one that was in hospital. And then we can also look in 2017 and say, and say we had two that were out of hospital and two that were in hospital. And just look, you can click around and let's say you want all of the years, not just the last five. Well, again, we can do the same thing. And so you can see how this is a super interactive tool that you could use and just look at some counts of your hospital. You could look at different infections if you wanted to. You could see all the different types, pump pocket, pump interior. So this is just one example of something really easy that you could do with just a few clicks. Okay, so let's erase the slate and start on something new. All right, so I'm gonna remove everything and we're just gonna do something brand new now, okay? Awesome. So now what we're going to do is we're going to scroll all the way to the bottom here and we're going to look at infection type. So if we move this here, again, bacterial, fungal, unknown, viral, and now we can see the different counts. So for our 102 infections, we can see 82 of them are bacterial, nine of them were fungal, seven of them were unknown, and, and four of them were viral. And so now instead of a bar chart, why don't we look at a pretty pie chart? And then we wanna do a filter by infection year. And so what this is showing us is now we can come down here and we can say, I only wanna look at 2015. And so in 2015, I had five bacterial infections, one unknown and one viral. And so what if you wanted to print this off and hand this to somebody? Well you know, a title just saying total is probably not really helpful. And so what we want to do is we like to make figures stand alone. Anything that we have in our reports, we want you to be able to pull it and it just tell the story. And so here we could do a really nice title. We can say infection type for hospital X. And then you could put, you know, your coverage. You could put your coverage and then just put, you know, your date ranges. And so here, you know, you, you would just put your date ranges. And so I'll just leave that, you know, X to X. And so here you would just put your different date ranges. And you can see how this would be so easy for you to just print this off, hand this to somebody. And with just a few clicks, you have done something really cool with looking at different infection types and also looking at infection, uh, the, you know, the different locations. And so a question that I get a lot whenever I'm helping people with this is, Devin, that's cool. I think it's really great that you could get instantaneous stuff, but I wanna do some like really hardcore research. I wanna look at a Kappa Meyer. I wanna do a p-value between you know, gender or something like that. And doing that kind of stuff with the form download is pretty complicated. Well, there are Excel ninjas out there who really can link these forms together and do that kind of stuff. It, it is very difficult. Um, I'm not gonna, you know, if you wanna do that, you can, but that's why we offer the SAS data sets. And that's what Ryan is gonna talk to you about today is all of the great things that you can do with the site research data sets that let's say you have on your research hat now and you wanna do a Kappa Meyer or you wanna look at time to anything time to event. So I'm gonna hand it over to Dr. Ryan Cantor to uh, talk about that. Thank you, Devin. No problem. Thank you. Thank you. That was great. So let me uh, share. I think you have to stop sharing your screen so that yes. I can share my screen. Okay. There we go. Do you all see my slide okay? Yes. Okay. Well, that was a great segue into. Um, some of the details I want to talk about Kaplan Meyer figures. And uh, just to echo uh, what Devin just said, the form downloads are a great, great way to explore your site's data on a data entry form by data entry form level. Um, but to truly capitalize on all of the analytic potential of the data that you've entered, you have to start merging forms together. You have to link an implant date with an event date, you know, have different uh, information across uh, the different patients and the different devices. And um, all of that work is done by John Pennington on our team to generate our research data sets. And so in my AQO uh, talk, I dug a little deeper into using your site's research data sets. So we make these research data sets at an aggregate level across Intermax. 
both for the reporting purposes and for any uh, research purposes as well. And in terms of, so these are the same data sets used in the QA reports when we're comparing different outcomes at a site to the aggregate Intermax data. And we provide that exact same data that's been merged together into analytically useful uh, data sets and that has been curated in a way um, that accounts for any data entry lag, any uh, data corrections from inline corrections and uh, provides uh, a bunch of the calculated uh, derived data uh, as well. And um, so what I did in the AQO talk was I described what those research data sets were, described how to gain access to those and what was included in the packet, because it's really um, much more than just a data set. And I used that to do a brief demo uh, trying to answer the question as if I were at Hospital X trying to determine are the males versus the females at Hospital X different in terms of key characteristics and different in terms of different patient outcomes. Um, so I want to review a couple of those top level concepts here and then take the conversation to the next step on, on not only how do we get an out of the box, you know, raw SAS output Kaplan-Meier, but but what do we need to do to bring it up to the same level as one of our QA report uh, you know, production figures? And then touch on some interpretation of those figures as well. So like Devin showed uh, in her uh, talk just now with the live data download, uh, the form download really empowers you to explore your data really as it's entered. So that's a useful tool uh, primarily for any kind of data quality checks you wanna do on a, at a larger scale or beyond our data quality report. Uh, you can go look at patterns of missing data or incomplete things really form by form. You could filter things by patient and anything that you could do on a form by form level, um, you know, think in your head, that's something I could get from my form download. And it's also really great because it's instantaneous. If you make changes in the system, you can re-download that Excel you know, as you find and correct uh, anything that you need to correct. Um, but to answer a, a research questions with statistically valid comparisons, you know, we have to manipulate that data, merge it together to get into a analytic ready data set. And so I touched on this uh, briefly, but to summarize, you got to link all the data together and we really create four different data sets, depending on what viewpoint you're looking at. If you have questions that are device level questions, there's a data set for that. If you have questions that are patient level, um, there's a data set for that. When we say it's the patient data set, it has both the patient uh, characteristic data, all their demographic data. It has one row per patient. It has all of their first implants, pre-implant form. And it also contains a lot of the key outcome data um, both the timing of any device exchanges, any registry endpoints, the timing of those endpoints, um, and much more uh, is contained there. Follow-up data sets are going to contain one row for patient follow-up. This also includes the pre-implant. We have that as kind of a follow-up in the discharge form. And then the events data set is one row uh, per adverse event, really any of the event-driven data collection. Um, these data sets are created, um, they're checked, intervals are derived. There's a built-in 30-day uh, kind of rollback to allow um, comparison between the Intermax aggregate. It limits everything to the validated form. What we mean by validated is fully submitted, like validated through the system, not some kind of external auditing, but just did you get it fully entered? Sometimes a form is not completely filled out and it's just kind of orphaned there in the system, or sometimes it's something that's really new and it's just waiting to be fully entered. Therefore, there could be potentially a number of missing fields in there. And so you really don't necessarily wanna analyze things um, until it's fully filled out. Um, the data set I'll be using today is from Hospital X. So all of the identifiable information has been shifted or encrypted, but in the data sets you receive, um, all of the fully identified data would be there. So all the patient names and IDs, medical record numbers, those types of information would be on every row of the different data sets. And like I said, these data sets are really ready for you to, well, in our case, use to make the QA reports, but in your case, maybe you have different analysis or data exploration or QA projects. Um, 
So just to recap, how do you get to this? Site administrators can click the reports tab and navigate through another screen and eventually get to where they see the Intermax site data set zip. And like I mentioned, this is much more than just the data. It's the data and the documentation you need um, to really build out an analysis. So you can see here it has the, and, and this is a snapshot of all this documentation at the time that these are generated. You know, Intermax evolves over time, questions are added, uh, questions are removed, and documentation changes. And so when you're doing analysis, you really want to know what was the state of the registry at the time those analysis, at the time those data sets were generated. So this has a whole folder of all the printable forms. Those printable forms in there, I'm not going to show one on the screen, but it's a, a PDF that shows the exact question as it is on the screen. Uh, I believe they're annotated, uh, but if they're not, the annotations are also in the data dictionary. So you have a data dictionary with each question in the registry and where it comes out in the different data set. It has all of the derived variables, all the intervals with their labels and definitions. Um, it's a little uh, overwhelming when you first open it, but as you start exploring and as you link uh, in your mind what's on the printable form, you see where it comes out in the data. And uh, with, with knowledge of a few key variables, you can go pretty far in an analysis. You, know, you have to know how to identify a patient. You have to know how to identify the interval for the outcome and the outcome that you're interested in. Um, and all of that is readily available. We also provide an overview of the research data sets that's a great place to start that describes the structure of each data set, as I did briefly earlier, only in more detail. And it also describes how all the research data sets link together. Uh, now, for the main thing that we really care about, you see these four SAS data sets. These are these things labeled as .sas7, BDAT. That's just the SAS data file type. We're a SAS shop. shop. At the DCC, uh, I love programming in SAS. It's a really useful language. But these statistical methods that we use can be done in a number of different uh, programs. You could use open source software like R, or some people like SPSS or Status, really depending on the, the uh, research field they're in and the, um, and the, uh, the background they're coming from. You know, Excel is pretty powerful if you get the right plugins for it. I've seen people write code to do Kaplan-Meier code within Excel. I mean, this would be, like Devin said, Excel gurus. And so, you know, we're, we, we realize people might want to use other statistical software packages. So we provide the same data in text file format with some instructions of how to import them into Excel. You know, maybe you want to do a project that is still pretty friendly in Excel, some counts, some pivot tables or whatnot, but you want to do it off your research data. Um, there's a workflow that makes that pretty accessible uh, within these uh, site data set packets. Okay, so in my AQO talk, I talked about how can we create a Kaplan-Meier from the hospital X data, from their primary prospective patients, and how can we compare survival on a device between men and women at hospital X? Might be a little hard to read, but you can see I can get to that in about you know less than 10 lines of code uh, within SAS. Um, I won't go into much detail the syntax other than I have to tell uh, the statistical program where the data lives. I have to tell it which formats um, to use. And I have to tell it um, to do a Kaplan-Meier, which is done using proc life test. I mentioned you have to know the uh, correct variables to talk about your outcome. So within our data, dead underscore PT is the patient level uh, death indicator, zero or one. And the interval int DPT is the patient level interval for what happens on a device. So what I mean by patient level is the, the clock still rolling if a patient gets a device exchange. Um, you might consider doing other types of analysis where you do device level. Um, and you'd have to um, read through the documentation and select the other uh, outcome and interval variable. You can see the line here that, oops, the line here that says strata gender, that's the variable for gender. Um, so that's telling it what to make the different lines for. So this is about as far as I got into things on the AQO talk. So I wanna spend a little bit more time today to compare, you know, what's the gap in presentation between what SAS gives you right here and what we produce in the 
uh, in the QA reports. This, from a statistical standpoint or analytic standpoint, is using the same math and providing the same result. Um, but as you can tell, you know, some of the words on the screen don't make it uh, super accessible. And I wouldn't say this, uh, this image stands alone. Like if you just looked at this, would you know, you know what this analysis was about? So I wanna talk about good practices and what you put on a Kaplan-Meier curve and show you some shortcuts of how to get that even if you um, aren't doing much more coding beyond what I have here. And then briefly talk about interpreting some of the key elements on this curve and why we use them to begin with and uh, talk about some ideas I have for future presentations uh, on the topic. Um, okay, so why are we using Kaplan-Meier curves and survival analysis to begin with? So survival Kaplan-Meier curves are, are a descriptive way to do one type of survival analysis, which is really just time to event analysis. And in the medical world, it usually really is survival, looking at time uh, to a mortality event. But um, in other fields, it might be time to part failure or um, time to some type of event. You know, it doesn't have to be necessarily death as the event. Um, but this example today, we will be using mortality as the outcome. So this approach is very useful in follow-up studies uh, for key reasons um, that I'll mention here. So in follow-up studies like Intermax, where you're following a cohort over time, uh, it's usual the case that patients get enrolled at different points in time and the follow-up varies for those patients. Um, also, if the follow-up is ongoing, if you're doing an analysis where you have to say, I'm going to use the data right now, and you know, some patients still will have a device in place. So, um, but all we know about is that the day that the data was collected, uh, they're still alive on a device. And also scenarios where a patient is lost to follow-up um, or other events are possible. So in the Intermax scenario, this would be transfer to a non-Intermax site that could happen, or uh, rarely if a patient withdrew consent when, uh, you know, historically when there were informed consent on the patients, um, or if a patient receives a transplant or has a cessation of support, those are events that preclude you from then dying with the device providing support. Um, so if you have an unobserved event, that's called censoring. So the patients are in the analysis for a given amount of time, um, but then the analysis has stopped. So they have a certain follow-up time and you haven't observed the event yet. So censoring is another way to say unobserved event. So you know some amount of time where they didn't have the event, but you don't know how long it is until they would have had the event. So if you have a patient in Intermax that you implanted three months ago, you know that they're alive on device at the time the data gets pulled for three months. Um, but you don't know how long they will survive on the device in the future. That's an example of a censored patient that got censored at study close. You know, alternatively, you might have a patient that you implanted several years ago, and then after a year, they got a transplant. So this patient is censored at the time of transplant. Um, if we're doing a, um, a, uh, a Kaplan-Meier curve like the main figures in the QA reports, you know, you might make other analyses where that transplant event is one of the actual events you consider. Uh, and I'll get into that a little bit at the end here. Um, so uh, in the example of Intermax, you know, often we're interested in, in analyzing mortality on a device. So the event is death on a device and the censoring mechanisms are study close, um, transplant and cessation of support. This is important to understand what both the event is and the censoring mechanisms because uh, it plays into how you interpret your results. So I mentioned I want to talk about what one of our production figures look like and some of the key design elements. So this is besides the actual math, it's just how you communicate to the audience uh, what went on in the analysis. So like Devin said in her uh, talk, we really want images to stand alone. Or if you're presenting data to someone, you want the information on the slide to be enough to interpret it. And so what that uh, includes is an informative title. You know, here we see this is, well, we see that it's Intermax branded. So we know it's from Intermax. We know it's primary prospective implants from a certain 
year range, you know, we might interpret this differently if we knew these were outcomes from patients several years ago or only patients from the last year. Uh, which patients were selected? This is coming from the primary prospective uh, patient data set. And it's talking about the outcome that is post implant survival. So that gives us you know, a lot of information just from the title and the logo. We've defined the study cohort. This idea of time zero, whenever you're doing a follow-up study, you need a clear definitive time zero, which is um, here is implant date. Um, we get that from the axis here that we've defined that this is month after device implant. So that's helping us get a clue of what the time zero is. And just an aside, if you're setting up analysis of your own, it's really good practice to make sure whatever you're stratifying by is known at time zero. So here we know gender at time zero. Well, here we know site. We know what site you're at at time zero. Therefore, it's statistically valid to stratify by whether or not um, whether or not, I mean, stratify the outcome by that characteristic. If you start stratifying by characteristics that are only discoverable after your time zero, that's a clue that you're validate that you're 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 making some statistically invalid choices. Uh, that's because people will have to survive long enough to have that event to then be stratified into the different lines. So that's getting a little bit more into study design and beyond the scope of uh, the current talk. But the take home message is. You know, if you're stratifying your analysis, stratify by things that you know at time zero. So I mentioned, what is the event? Depending on what kind of figure you choose from the QA report, you know, we report a lot of different events. This is one of the main figures that people uh, like to use from their QA reports. And here the event is death. And we also define the censoring mechanisms, transplant or cessation of support. Um, so this gives us a lot of information here to really know that we're not talking about things that happen after transplant on this report. We're only talking about, on this uh, figure, we're only talking about what's happened on a device up until the patient um, is no longer supported by uh, a device and it's reported to Intermax. If you have comparison groups, you want them clearly defined. Here we have STS Intermax, the aggregate versus the hospital X. Uh, you want some measure of uncertainty. So, I mean, we could just draw the lines, but is there a lot of uncertainty or is there a little uncertainty? So we do that in two ways on our standard curves. We have the patients at risk listed here, uh, 100 patients from hospital X and almost 30,000 patients in Intermax because this is from the overall, you know, all time report. And so you can see the number of patients at risk declines over time because patients meet the various registry endpoints. Um, but you can see after about 60 months, Hospital X only has 12 patients. So you also see that as time progresses, the confidence intervals on those estimates from Hospital X increase. Uh, so you, you wouldn't want to weigh too heavily on information where there's only a few patients at risk and very wide confidence intervals. We actually have the confidence intervals on the Intermax line as well, but with this many patients at risk along the way, we can make really good average estimates. And so those confidence intervals are so tight, um, you can barely see them beyond the line. Finally, um, because people commonly want to quote numbers at specific time points, you know, annually along this curve, rather than just pick out, you know, ha having you estimate it you know, by hand or by eye right off the, the chart, you know, we try to make it easy to report, you know, to one decimal place right below it and the uh, confidence intervals as well. So a lot of good information and thought went into the design of, you know, every Kaplan-Meier in the QA report. You know, now if we flash back to what a SAS look like when you get the raw, uh, raw output, you know, it's the same idea of a Kaplan-Meier, you know, time to event, um, reporting here, but oops, sorry, a lot of the a lot of the ancillary information that's important to interpret is not directly put on the figure by SAS. And this would probably be the same in any of the other common uh, statistical reporting programs. And so, you know, as a user of the data and an analyst, you need to take it one step further. So I would recommend at the very least, put some informative labels to address many, if not all of these um, characteristics. You know, with the code I provided in SAS, I went ahead and showed you how to use options to get at risk and show the confidence intervals. Um, 
if you look at published manuscripts, not this, this isn't always the case, but it makes it really frustrating to interpret something if you don't have this level of uncertainty. Um, we also present the uh, log rank p value here. So that's useful. And it, you know, it tells you that it's a log rank p value that tells you what it is. Um, another thing you want to check uh, at when you present data is do you have an appropriate x scale and y scale? So let's start with the y scale. You know, survival probability ranges from zero and to one, so zero to 100%. You know, this is the proportion. Um, and so typically you want to show this whole range. I've seen some presentations really zoom in to highlight a, a effect that you know, maybe they zoom in to 90% to 100% to show what looks like a really striking difference. Uh, but really that difference might be quite minimal and uh, if you've zoomed in that much. I mean, that's fine to do, but you really wanna highlight anytime you deviate from the full scale of zero to 100% here. So uh, if you're gonna zoom in, I recommend putting a little box, you know, really highlight it, put a little red box around your, your axis here. Um, but I would always recommend um, showing the full scale. Now for an appropriate Y scale, you can see from the numbers at risk beyond about 60 months, we really no longer, this is just the hospital X data for this demo. That's why we have a lot fewer um, patients. You know, they total to 100 here for our, our demo exploration of male versus female difference in survival at hospital X. You can say after about 60 months, there aren't patients at risk to get valid estimates of the survival anymore. You see that the at risk is below five, uh, the confidence intervals are huge. Um, it's a little weird because your eye is naturally attracted to this part of the screen because that's where the most ink is on the page, but that's actually where we know the least about survival. Where we know the most and have the most accurate estimates is right here at the beginning. So when you present this data, uh, it's probably more effective to go ahead and roll your axis back to where you have better estimates than allowing it to go um, completely to the end. Uh, I mean, it depends on what you're trying to do. So you'd have to make a decision. Um, so here I've cropped that to 60 months. And just with Excel, putting some labels on top of things, you can see if we add a little bit more descriptive title to say this is from Hospital X and that it's survival on a device by gender. If we add a little bit more descriptive Y axis months after implant. And if we add event is death, and really I should have written death on a device and censoring at transplant or cessation of support. We've covered most of the elements on my list of good design. Uh, and this is a lot more informative, especially if you're showing multiple figures to someone, uh, it's really useful to make each one uh, standalone. So this is my final slide. I wanna mention, how do we interpret some of the things we see on this curve? So I'll start with the estimates itself. Um, I don't have a table here like I have on the QA reports, but you can see that at about 10 months, the estimate for males is about 70. So what does that mean? An estimate of 0.7 at 10 months for the male curve. And so the question I'm asking is how do you interpret the estimation provided at a specific time point from a Kaplan-Meier curve? And it's the percent survival beyond that time point. So if we have a 0.7 on our scale here, that means 70% of males survive on a device for 10 months or longer. And this is if transplant or cessation of support weren't an option. This is a kind of a hypothetical situation, but it's a very valid comparison if you're trying to highlight what is the risk on the device itself. Uh, once the patient has cessation of support or transplant, you know, it's a whole uh, another set of risks for the next event that happens after that. And so, um, you know, a complementary analysis to this Kaplan-Meier uh, depiction is depicting um, time to all of those different registry endpoints at the same time. And so uh, I think it'd be interesting to do a future lecture specifically on how to do and how to interpret competing risk analysis. Um, but, you know, for this talk, uh, interpreting the Kaplan-Meier uh, was the scope of what I wanted to go over today. So it's, like I said, survival beyond that uh, point in time, the percent surviving beyond that point in time, given whatever your event and censoring mechanisms are. 
So what about the log rank p-value? So the log rank p-value is going to take a look at the effect and ask, is there a statistically significant difference between these two lines averaged out across the entire um, reporting period? So this is valid if the proportional hazard assumption is maintained. And so what I mean by that is if the two lines stay relatively parallel with each other and don't cross each other drastically, this will be a valid uh, comparison. But sometimes you might end up in a situation where the two curves drastically uh, you know, cross over each other if there's really different risk patterns between the groups. And in those scenarios, you might not get a statistically significant p-value because it's going to average out the, the crisscross over your whole cohort. And you know, there might be a difference early and a difference late uh, that will be masked by averaging that out. But you know, in this case, the curves don't cross each other drastically and look relatively similar in shape. And so this would be a statistically valid way to compare these results and the p-values above 0.05. So I would conclude that there's not statistical evidence that males versus females do differently um, at hospital X. And finally, how do these confidence intervals help us? And one thing, I, I made a mistake when I did this, but I, but I left it in to show you uh, how uh, you should you know, pay attention and annotate things. I should have put the confidence interval on here, like the definition. Uh, typically on our QA reports, we use a 70% confidence interval. And the reason we do that is when you have two curves that are parallel like this and the 70% confidence intervals are depicted, they will just start to touch each other when the uh, p-value is 0.05. Um, it's a little uh, more complicated if the curves really cross each other, like I mentioned before, but the default uh, presentation in for, for many Kaplan-Meier uh, depictions that I see in the literature is the 95% confidence interval. That's perfectly valid. Both are, are perfectly valid numerical ways um, to depict the data. And uh, as long as you tell people which one you're using, um, I will note that you might have a p-value that indicates that a statistically significant difference, but with a 95% confidence intervals, uh, they overlap I mean, they're a little bit wider, and so they'll they'll be overlapping a little bit at that time point. So, you know, we chose the 70% confidence intervals to mirror what your eye is trying to do and to make it more interpretable. You know, you when you look at this, when you see things get a clear separation, you know, with the 70% confidence interval, that's indicative of a statistically significant difference. Um, so that's why we chose those confidence intervals. So I've gone into a lot of detail about why we use Kaplan-Meier curves, how we generate them, and uh, best practice and how to display that information, and kind of the decisions we made to make the, the, the figures we show in the QA report. Um, I'd love to get feedback, questions, either in the chat box or, or via the email, what you think about uh, this format for, for digging deeper into the analysis and uh, anything that you'd like me to go uh, into more detail in. You know, I already uh, am thinking about, you know, at some point uh, providing a deeper dive into the competing risk analysis and perhaps the rates. Uh, those are two things that we get a lot of questions on. Uh, so with that, I'll conclude. So thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ryan. I really appreciate that. Um, I think next um, we have just a few minutes left for um, answer some questions and I will definitely um, start reading those um, as we have them. So it looks like um, our first question is from Kelly Shoemate and she's saying that she submitted an FAQ on September 9th asking about a patient that is still coming up on the pending form tab as after expected date which was September 12, 2020, and the patient had de deceased in June. Yes. Kelly, I actually replied to you a couple of weeks ago, but I'm keeping, I have not, we have not removed that form yet because it seems like there was a mini version, some data field, a mini upgrade a month or two ago. And we have, I've, I've been receiving many of these emails. So I want the programmers to to take a look at it, but thank you. 
Thank you for your question. Um, and then Heather would like to know, I'm wondering how many other programs are using the Intermax data to inform what they do in their programs? And I'm thinking that Heather, um, you're referring to if you're for patients or for internal use. I know that we, um, we receive we actually received many um, minor data quality requests um, during the last few months regarding this. Um, sometimes the sites will use the data um, for patient education and sometimes the sites will use it um, just internally for quality use. But if any sites would like to um, type in how they use um, their Intermax data and how they do for their programs, that would be great to share. Um, the next question is, is there any way to get quarterly reports that report out all adverse events with the patient name or medical record number? I believe, um, John, Devin, or Ryan, would you like to answer that? I'm happy to take a stab on it. Uh, okay. John, feel free to, to jump in here at any point in time. Uh, but there, there are a number of ways you can interact with the data that we provide back that would get you very close to this um, right now. So uh, the form downloads do have the medical record and patient number on every row, I believe, and correct me if I'm not, if I'm wrong here, John, um, but uh, you would have to aggregate those um, by, you know, like it's coming out with the different forms. So you, you might have to put a couple of those together to get the overall uh, count. And then another way to explore this is through the uh, patient summary. So, you know, that would list out many, if not all of the adverse events. Um, also, if you downloaded your SAS data sets uh, or in text, uh, you could go to the events build and uh, that would also have in it. So that might actually be the most direct way to get to it from the data that we have right now. Um, you know, you'd have to figure out how you wanted to format that type of report. But in the, in the SAS site data sets, there's the event build that is one row per adverse event and it has what the type of the adverse event is, it has the date of the adverse event, all the details of the adverse event, and I believe the, uh, the patient information. Is that correct? Can you confirm that, John? Hey, yeah, uh, so this is John. I didn't jump in at first because I thought it was a reporting question. Um, yeah, so to echo what Ron said, I would, I would say I think the easiest way to do this would be to work with those SAS data sets. And like he said in his uh, talk, even if you're not comfortable with SAS, you can open up the text limited file in Excel really easy and we got those instructions packaged with it. Um, I don't recall if in the form data download the um, patient name and MRN or each role you have to forgive me I'd have to look and I'd be happy to get back with you if you need me to. Um, but yeah I would say um, the last bit of what you said Ron is is accurate for getting those adverse events together via the, the builds. I think that's the simplest way to do it. Okay thank you John and Ron. Uh, the next question would be, would it be possible to include the VAD implant date in which device the patient received on the live data download forms? For example, the rehospitalization form. So the way that it's currently structured now, it's not like that, but you could link them together if you knew like what to link by a uh, patient ID, event ID, that type of thing, because where the VAD implant date and the device type are living are in a separate form than the rehospitalization form. That's, I think, that on the, it's on the implant form, and it has the date, and it has the device type, and then you'd have to link them together that way. So currently, they're not that way, but you could get to that using that, uh, using Excel, if you were to link them together. Yeah, I echo what Devin's saying. Like every row is going to have the event ID because um, mm -hmm. the, all these events and rehospitalizations, follow ups, et cetera, they're all tied to a, a device. Um, so you could pretty easily join that in Excel by going to the, uh, the implant form. Uh, I can also, though, talk to our, our web um, 
web devs and see if it's possible to include the endpoint date on each form because I can see how that would be pretty pretty convenient to calculate intervals things like that on each one of these individual forms and that is kind of the overhead info like the the patient ID and the event ID. Okay, thank you. Um, and then a comment from Melissa Williams, Conver converting the dates through an equal to date value will allow you to toggle between monthly, quarterly, et cetera, instead of just year. Awesome, thanks. Um, from Jennifer, when is the registry expected to be updated? This is a great question. Um, thank you for asking. Version 6.0 is slated to go live up November, um, I believe we said Monday, November 16th. Um, that will give us, I will please be on the lookout. You'll be receiving information about webinars before we have the um, version go live so we can do the training ahead of time. And the user's guide and the data collection forms will also be updated and available to you soon. The next question, is there an expected frequency with which the structure of the SAS files will change? We hope not often. <laughs> yeah. yeah, in an ideal world, never. This is John. Um, so I can tell you for sure this, the structure of the SAS files will change some following uh, November. So like the, uh, we put out the, the research SAS data sets each quarter. Um, so the, the upload that would go out in quarter one of 2021 will look somewhat different because of the updates that we'll do to Intermax in version six here in November. Um, the general idea behind them won't change. Like each table will be patient-based, event-based, follow-up-based. Um, but what changes is kind of the column makeup and if we do any new calculations for you. Okay, thank you. The next question from Sue Ellen. If you have a chronic AE, such as infection, that has entered each readmission and you enter the same start date for each entry, will the infection event be entered? Um, I'm assuming, are you, um, I'm one, I guess this is a chronic infection and that's why you're entering the same start date. So Sue Ellen, I will definitely send you our FAQs on chronic infection so you can look at that. And um, we might need you to change how you're entering those chronic infections. But if anyone wants to address the, um, about the infection being counted as one event or each time it's entered, um, feel free. John, or I, I, I'm happy to, to tackle this one. So, um, and, and you're right, Catherine. I can't speak to the the um, the uh, the user guidelines on what to enter. But if you enter different infection forms, like you are hitting submit and you have different forms, that is each one of those will be counted uniquely in the um, tally for AEs. Okay, and to bounce off of that, this, this is John too. So we, um, I believe a little while ago, removed that collection for ongoing infection. So if, if I'm understanding the question right, this does sound like that, but Catherine, I would defer to you there. Yes, I'll send her the FAQ sheet so she can look at it. And we did, we removed ongoing, I think in 2014. But um, I'm excited about version 6.0. Thank you so much to our presenters today, Ryan and Devin. You did an amazing job. And thank you for the UAB um, reporting team that was on. Really appreciate your time today. I've put up on the slides, um, the first um, link is where you can find um, all things Intermax, the user's guide, um, your quality of life surveys, data collection forms, um, how to contact us. Um, the second link is going to be the report's um, email address. You can contact them directly if you have issues with your reports or you need passwords to them or if you have just new ideas. Um, and you can also go to the www.sts.org and you can find the um, Intermax FAQs email. I will let you know there's about, um, we like to like to re respond as soon as we can with the FAQs mailbox, but we have a, a 30 day, uh, we'll get back to you at least within 30 days. And um, I appreciate everyone joining today and thank you. Thank you to the reporting team and thank you for Carol and Leanne for your um, 
for your presence today and your support. Thanks, everybody. Great job. Yeah, turn it to you, Amy. It was a good day. Thank you. Thank you.